Amen. One chapter down. This is important stuff. And, you know, it also is one of my favorite things, just reading scripture and just letting it take me wherever it takes me. But it's all, all of this is in the same context, though. All of this is about him trying to tell a group of people whose peace was going to be greatly disturbed. Now, remember, this is also a group of people, and you're also like this, and I didn't say this during the teaching, but this is during the afterburn, so you'll get this as an extra piece. They were already in a place of disturbed peace before they met him. So were you. Their lives were not wonderful before they met him. They were under Roman occupation. They were struggling through the day-to-day -day things that were going on. He brought hope to them. He brought understanding to them. He gave them a path that they could walk that would lead them to the peace that they desired, the deliverance that they desired, okay, the salvation, if we want to say it that way, that they desired. And so you're in the same place. You did not have him, and your life was a certain way. Then you now have him, and your life should be different. Even if it's not physical in the detail so much different, but you should have a whole different approach to it because you now have him. And if that isn't making a difference, then you really don't have him. Think of it that way. If you're not changed in the level of shalom you have, while all of the things are going badly in your life, you really have not fully received him. And that's what we talked about in the beginning of the teaching. All right, so in the afterburn here, we're going to allow for Manny to read some comments and questions. Okay, we have one question so far from Aaron Murray. It says, question, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi said, if you've seen me, it's like seeing the Father. Scripture says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Please explain. No, in other words, if, for you, if you're wondering what the Father's all about, okay, if you see Yeshua, which is what they literally were seeing him, how he acts, what he says, what he does, how he approaches things, that's like seeing the Father because everything about him was a perfect disciple. And a perfect disciple is an exact perfect replica of the one you're discipling. You are learning to be them. And so this is the chain, though, that becomes a challenge. If you are discipling with someone who is very much imperfectly discipled under whoever they were supposed to be discipled from, now you're becoming an imperfect copy because you're copying an imperfect copy. And all of us, to a certain degree, are copying imperfect copies because we're learning from flawed human beings, but we're looking to hopefully find those that are doing it as close to the truth and the actual um, template as we can. So he personally discipled the 12. They were sent to go make personal disciples of more who would then go make disciples of more. So that's why Paul would use the language of imitate me because that's discipleship. As I imitate Yeshua. That's also discipleship because you shouldn't be discipling with someone who isn't imitating the chain up the line of what you really want to be like. You don't imitate your discipler because you want to be him. You imitate the discipler because of who the disciple was trained by up the chain. And so Yeshua says, imitate me because if you imitate me, you're imitating the Father. If you listen to me, you're listening to the Father. If you're doing what I tell you, you're doing what the Father tells you to do. Perfect discipleship. Hopefully that answered the question. So I should be able to, as your teacher say, like Paul, imitate me, not in everything I do, because I'm a flawed human being, as I imitate Yeshua. And you should want to be like me when you see me being Yeshua-like. If you hear Yeshua's words and the Father's words, etc., coming out of me, then that makes it useful. Then at that, point, at that point, I'm actually useful. Otherwise, when I'm being a flawed human being, like everybody has the opportunity to be, don't imitate that. All right? But the goal is that we keep growing more and more like him so that we are being less and less of the world and more and much more of him, and he's not of the world. We're not supposed to be of the world. We're in the world. But sometimes we act like we're of the world, all of us. That's the stuff we imitate really easily, though. We have no problem imitate people when they act worldly. Next question. Okay, we have another one. Uh, 
from Steve, can you clarify John 14, 28 and the word greater? I showed my Trinitarian friend and he said the word greater simply means older. No. No, I mean, I think it's very clear, okay, that there's a hierarchy here. Yeshua says, everything my Father says I do. There's nothing I say or do that doesn't come from the Father. I am completely submitted to the authority of my Father. There is clearly a hierarchy there. Okay? Okay, Olivier and Janet Hoffman. Rabbi, thank you so much. So in Wait, John hold on, hold on. Also, just looking back at John 14, in the context of everything he's saying... He's saying it, look at the context. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You've heard I said I am going away and I'm coming to you. And you're all worried about me leaving. He says, I'm not, I'm not even that big a deal. He says, I'm going to the Father. He's the one that's important. I'm going to him and he's greater than I. This is to your benefit, is what he's saying. Not he's older. Let's put older in there, see if this makes any sense. You heard that I said I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you did love me, you would have rejoiced that I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is older than me. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't, there's no value in that. My Father's older than me, so I should be going there. No, you think I'm so big a deal. He said, but I'm going to my Father. He's the real big deal. Okay? That's the point, and that's why he says, look at the context and go back to like verse 21. He who possesses my commands and guards them is he who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father. Don't be so worried about me loving you. You'll get my Father's love. That's a much bigger deal. You see? The context of all of this is that you should be more impressed with my Father than me. Can we see that? All the way through, he keeps talking about the Father being greater than he says, and this will get you his love. Forget about my love. You should want my father's love. If you love me and guard my commandments, you'll have my father's love. You'll be loved by my father. That's the important thing. He's trying to transfer all of their emotional stuff towards him. He's trying to transfer it up to the father. All of their feelings for him, all of the way that they were impressed with him, they saw the miracles, they saw the signs, all the things that he did, and said, no, you need to now realize my father's way more impressive than I am. And if you can do the things I'm teaching you, you'll have his love. All right, go ahead. So it's in the context, older makes no sense. Although it's probably true. I don't know if there's a way to age. There's no time with them. How could older make any sense when they're outside of time? <laughs> There you go, all right? They, they dwell outside of the realm of time, so how could older have anything to do with anything? All right, go ahead. Okay, Olivia and Janet Hoffman. Rabbi, thank you so much. In John chapter 14, 17, so if the actual Messiah is in us, then we can truly do his will to the full context. Is that what chapter 14, 13 is saying? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of tied together there. But he's saying, look, it's not that because he's in you, you can, you can do all these things. Remember, this is being offered to you as a help, as a helper. Not a do it for you, not an enabler. It's a helper. Okay? And that's really the important thing. The helper. The idea that it will stir to remembrance, it will teach you and remind you all the things that I told you. This is the key here. Okay? Verse 26, the helper, the set-apart spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name, shall teach you all and remind you of all that I have said. Teach you meaning instructing you on how to apply what I said. If it doesn't remind you, if, if you don't know what Yeshua said, the spirit isn't just going to spontaneously just manifest it to you. You are to do your part. He doesn't give to you as the world gives. He's not just going to hand it to you and manifest it spontaneously. Now, I know you're thinking, well, Rabbi, but you say he does that with you. When I'm teaching, he's giving me what you need, not what I need. Okay? So while I'm teaching, he's, the, he's stirring. Now, by the way, he's stirring up stuff that I have already read and connect. If I didn't know Revelation 21, and I didn't know as I'm in John 14, and I didn't have those verses, there would be nothing for the Ruach to connect. I take you all kinds of places, not places I've never been in the scriptures, not verses I never thought of before. It's the connections that I never, that I may never have thought of before. And the connections is what the teacher aspect of the helper is doing. 
But had I not studied these things, there wouldn't be anything to connect. All right, go ahead, next. Cheryl would like to know, would the fear of disappointing Yahweh in greater tribulation be a lack of emunah, not fear of the tribulation itself, but fear of disappointing him in those trials? Listen to the fear of Yahweh teaching. That's exactly the point. Okay, the only fear you should have is the concern that you would disappoint him. Okay, that ultimately, not that you disappoint him on a daily basis. We do disappoint him on a daily basis. But you should have enough concern about disappointing him on a daily basis that you make an effort not to do it. But the only thing you should be afraid of, so to speak, is having an awe and a reverence enough for him that you want to not disappoint him. Okay? But that's not a fear like he's going to zap me and make me a grease spot. It's a fear that I love him so much. Look, if you... I want to word this right, because some of you are struggling in your marriages. If you remember when you first fell in love, when you first were to get married, even when maybe when you were dating, and you really had the strong emotion for that person, the one thing you were trying to be careful of, hopefully, was you didn't want them to look at you with their head down looking at you like, what in the world did you just do? That disappointed, embarrassed, ashamed for you type like, I can't believe you just did that. That's, that's because you cared so much about their opinion on what you were doing. Okay? See, a lot of times we have trouble disciplining our children. You know why we have trouble disciplining our children? Because they've not a strong enough love relationship with you because you've not earned that and worked that out so that the child actually's biggest thing is that they don't want to let you down. Because if they cared about letting you down, they would not do some of the things they do because they would care. They could care less about letting you down because you've never worked out the level of love you need to in relationship with that child. You don't spend time with the child. You, all you do is criticize and, and yell at the child. Some of you own this. I know you do. And so the child really could care less about disappointing you. They feel like they're always disappointing you. What's the difference? If you never express how much they please you when they do, and encourage them and all those kind of things. But he doesn't want us to be walking around in a state of fear. He wants us to be walking around in a state of optimistic, hopeful belief. In other words, the optimism and the hope and belief that if I make the effort, Deuteronomy 8.2, to show in my heart that I want to obey the covenant, to keep the commandments, that I get to be in Revelation 21. That's what you hold on to, not the constant paranoia. I hope I don't blow this. I hope I don't blow this. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And by the way, there are people doing that. There are people calling me up saying, Rabbi, I can't do this. I'm never going to make it. I'm, I'm, I'm not good. At, I can't. Why would he ever want me? You can't, you'll, you can't get there that way. You have to. He called you. I haven't said this in a couple of weeks. Called you when and where in your life, knowing full well that that moment you could still get from where you are to the kingdom. He knows everything you did before that moment. He knows everything you did since that moment. But he called you whenever he called you, knowing from that point you could get there. From that moment you could arrive. Embrace that with all of your heart. That doesn't mean that you will arrive. It means you can. Don't get into one of these once saved, always saved mindsets. Go listen to are you saved. Okay? You can. He knew you could make it. He called you. He didn't call you to fail. And he's never wrong, which means that he knew that if he called you, you could make it. He also knows that some of the people he calls won't because of their own choices. But he called you knowing you could. Now what are you going to do? It's all in your hands. What are you going to do? Okay? I mean, you know what? I'm going to use an old, old saying. It's an old, old proverb. I forget what religion it might have come from, whatever it is. But it's a story about the person who goes up to the wise man, and he's got the bird in his hand. And he asks the wise man, is the bird alive or dead? And he says, well, if I say it's dead, you're going to try to prove me wrong and show me it's alive. But if I say it's alive, you could crush it, and then you open up your hands, it's dead. So really, you have the power. Well, that's your life. You, you're the bird. You, have the, you are the bird. You have that power. 
You could decide whether you live or die. You can only decide that because he's opened your eyes. So he's given you the way, the truth, and the life to get to, well, the way and the truth to get to the life. So you, you're like the person holding the bird in that story. A lot of you have heard that story. It's an old story. Probably goes back hundreds of years or whatever it goes back. All right, next question. Uh, Grizzly Adams, or Daniel Adams, would it be fair or reasonable to say a notable increase in our peace is a way given to see that we're heading in the right direction, building our relationship with him? That probably would work. I mean, you know. I would absolutely say that if you are doing those things, you should have a noticeable, measure, you know, measurable increase in your peace. I mean, we might find peace in, from wrong methods. I don't want to say that it's impossible to find peace in your life that's not from the correct path and just to get to that place. But if you are on the correct path, you should have absolutely a reduction in anxiety, worry, and fear, and all that other stuff, and an increase in your peace. Okay, next one is from... I mean, half the country right now is finding peace just by smoking marijuana. Now they have no, that's it. Yeah, I mean, that's not the path, you see. So just because they have an increase in their peace, you know, or they're numbing it with alcohol or doing some other thing, that you have, if you're walking this out, you should have much more peace. But don't just say, I have more peace. It means definitely it's because you're walking it out. Only you know what you're doing. Okay? Okay, next one is from Pete and Brenda Lamb. Um, question. Could the ruler of this world in 1430 also be talking about Rome and the Sanhedrin? It seems to fit the context of the events which are about to unfold. Certainly. It certainly could do that as well. Okay? Now, bear in mind, it wasn't like Hasatan himself was coming, but he was going to use what he was going to use to try to accomplish thinking, I'm going to kill off this potential threat to his kingdom, which is Yeshua. And so, you know, through his minions, we'll call it, people that are under his influence. Okay, go ahead. Okay, question from Kerry. When Moshe saw Yeshua, is it, it, it changed his appearance and he had to wear a mask. Why is this different when Yeshua was with the people before his death? Because, in, okay, look. Yeshua, as we see in the Father and the Son teaching, we see play out, there's different, um, I don't know what the right word is to explain it, you know, different levels that he can uh, turn up or down his manifestation. He, he, he met with Abraham, didn't affect Abraham at all, okay, but he was there, you know, manifest himself like he looked like a, like a human being, and he had to turn down the volume, so to speak, so that he could sit there and have lunch with Abraham, we see in Moses, though, he's meeting with him in a much more full expression of his essence. And so this changes Moses' appearance, okay, in the, in the interaction. And then when Moses wants to see him in his fullness, you know, Yahweh says, no, can't do it, kill you. Okay, I'll cover you in the cleft of the rock, and then you can see a little bit of me, but I'm not going to, you can't see me. And so... It's the level of that manifestation that changed the appearance. Now, in the case of Yeshua, Yeshua is now encased in a flesh suit. Okay, it's a whole different thing. He's now encased in a flesh suit. And so we have John 1.14. He says, and the word put on a flesh suit, put on flesh and dwelled amongst us. The flesh suit protected everybody from any of that kind of a problem. Okay. Now, bear in mind, as he was dying and being somewhere, you know, you know, as the, as the, you know, all that was going on, you saw all kinds of things were happening at uh, the place of his crucifixion. We know that there, there were all kinds of things happening because of that. But, you know, this all has to do with his level of manifestation that he could control. The Father, being greater, I believe, in the teaching I did, says, cannot interact with us in the flesh suits that we're in. We would die. Period which is why he doesn't show up to Revelation 21 when everybody has been changed into the incorruptible and no longer in a flesh suit. Because the end of chapter 20, you see that sin and death and all of that stuff is thrown into the lake of fire. There's no more. All right, go ahead. Okay, another one. Uh, Olivia and Janet Hoffman, Rabbi in Romans, 1 Corinthians, Jude, 1 Peter, etc. 
When Paul talks about favor and peace to the covenanted, is this favor referring to the ability to do his will or blessings from Elohim or both? I think I covered that in the grace teaching. It's, it's basically, may you merit his favor. Okay? In other words, merited favor and peace. He wants you to have both these things. May you, may you have favor that you merit. In other words, go do what you need to do. Have the peace that comes from that. You that are in covenant, walk this out. All right? Okay. And I cover that because I know I use the greetings as part of the, um, the grace teaching because after all, in all of the Christian books and all the Bibles that they have, it says grace, not peace, not favor. There it says grace. And so that was, we covered every verse that the word grace appears. So, all right? So it's, it's, it's merited favor. But listen to the search for the doctrine of grace and then you'll have that. These are all core teachings. I mean, you need to have these core teachings. Are you saved? Search for the doctrine of grace. Do you know the Father and the Son? These are core understandings that you need. Are you covenanted? Darkness and light. Darkness and light is a new one added to that list. I, I really think that's a very important teaching. Okay, go ahead. Michelle would like to know, uh, does it mean I'm cold-hearted because... I'm not worried, panicking, or troubled in these crazy situations. I have so much shalom and emuna, and not at all worried about any of this. I think I answered that already, yes. The answer would be yes, you are most likely experiencing that because you are accomplishing what Yeshua was talking about here, which is that you are seeing these things as all part of a bigger picture, and you're excited about what comes at the end and not worried about what happens in the middle. That's really the whole thing. Don't worry about what happens in the middle. Be excited about what happens at the end. At the end, we live happily ever after. In the middle, it gets really dicey. <laughs> it gets really tough. Okay? So she's doing good. She's not cold-hearted then. She's not what? She's not cold-hearted. Cold-hearted? No, you're doing great. Okay. <laughs> you said I yes. Could, I thought she said wholehearted, so I, didn't, I couldn't hear Got it. it. Cold-hearted. Yes. No, you're not cold-hearted. You're just have emunah. You have peace. People think I'm cold-hearted because of, the, you know, when these things. I'm not cold-hearted. I'm just not worried about any of this stuff. This stuff and worse stuff is going to happen. I, what you have is peace because you accept reality instead of being afraid about reality or concerned about it or whatever. You almost act like a fear of the unknown. What's unknown? You may get this disease. That was easy for me to say. You may get this disease. This disease. Okay, that was kind of tough with the is sound in both. You may get this disease and die. You may get hit in a car accident and die. You may get cancer and die. A million different things can happen to you and you could die. That is going to happen in your life. Be prepared for it. Have peace about it. Don't worry about it. Something eventually is going to kill you, even if it's just the end of days and you just lay down and just that's it, which is ideal, but you're going to die. How it happens shouldn't really matter to you, okay? It's going to happen. That's what matters. And it's going to be a journey that you have to focus on. Focus on that you're doing everything with your utmost during the journey. That's your focus. No fear, no doubt, no worry, okay? Next point. And I apologize for misunderstanding the word there. Sounds like a good teaching, like motivated by death. Yeah, motivated by mortality. Um, <laughs> I sneak it in there every now and then. I don't have enough verses really to do that, but, you know. Okay, next one is uh, Jen. She's asking about uh, John 14, 23. Speaks of the Father and Yeshua dwelling within true believers, keepers of Torah. Is this not the essence of the Holy Spirit? Say that one more time. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he shall guide my word. My father shall love him. We shall come to him and make our stay with him. Her question right. is John 14, 23. Speaks of the father and Yeshua dwelling within true believers or keepers of Torah. Yeah. Is this not the essence of the Holy Spirit? I'm not understanding the last part of the question. The Holy Spirit is not what's being talked about. He's talking about literally the Father and the Son coming to live with us. The Holy Spirit is the means by which they have access to and communicate with you. All right? So that's what's being talked about in basically in chapter, in the same chapter in like verse 17, 16, 17, where he says the other helper. And in 26, the helper, the set-apart spirit from the Father, 
You know, that's happening now. He's talking about a future event in verse 23, not the Holy Spirit there, okay? Because he already said that the Holy Spirit will come, so to speak, in verses 16 and 17, if you love and guard the commands. He says that in verse 15, okay? But now he's talking about how this whole big picture sort of plays out. Okay, go ahead. Angela had a question um, regarding, I guess, John 8, 21, when, he's, when Yeshua says, you cannot come. She wants to know why he says you cannot come. Where? 821. Well, because he's talking to those that are not part of the group. He's talking to those that are scoffers or mockers. This is the, the Pharisees and etc. This is, you know, guys who are, are not getting it. You got to get the context of who he's talking to here. Okay, let's, let's kind of cover two things really quickly here. Number one, all right, you must have, as you're going through all of this, uh, this particular teaching, go and listen to Understanding the Ruach. Because if you don't understand the Ruach, you're not going to understand everything I said today. Matter of fact, I may confuse things a whole lot for you going through John 14 here. Go listen to Understanding the Ruach. That will explain everything that you need to know, know that will make sense of what I said today. Second thing is, when you look at verses like in John 8, 21, you must use the absolute... Um, like mantra I've been saying for years now. You must use context. Go back and figure out who's talking. Well, it's Yeshua. But who's he talking to? He's not talking to his disciples here. Okay? He is talking to set up our place. But if you go back in the chapter, there are people already grieving him grief and mocking him and saying, oh, blah, blah, blah about him. Those people, he said, you're not able to go where I'm going. <laughs> All right? All right, chapter 8, verse, um, like verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And he goes, in your, and in your, in, uh, in your Torah also it has been written that uh, two witnesses make something true. There are people that are attacking him and giving him problems, okay? Of course, John chapter 8, you know, has to do with uh, the lady, uh, you know, caught in adultery. I've got a whole teaching with that, Okay. Okay, look at verse 22. Then Yehudim said, he shall, you know, shall he kill himself because he says, where I go, you're unable to come? You know, and then he says, look, verse 23 explains it all. You are from below, I am from above. <laughs> There's a whole different thing going here. Look, we're not able to go where he's coming, liter going literally. And besides, Revelation 21 says it's coming here. But he is specifically talking to a bunch of people that are scoffing, mocking, not getting it. All right? So he's got to get, the whole thing is context. And this all happens after the woman caught an adultery thing. Okay? Okay, next question from Daniel Woods. How do people who experience extreme physical pain on a daily basis have shalom? I guess it has to do with, you know, your definition of shalom. Okay? Um, shalom has to do with accepting things as they are. It is what it is. You know... That's something you, that if you know me, you hear me say a lot. Okay, that's, that's definitely a rabbi thing that I say all the time. It is what it is. And if you have the ability to truly say it is what it is, then you means, that means you have peace with it. There's an acceptance. Now, it will disturb you. The pain is disturbing, and it disturbs your peace on a different level. Physically disturbs your, your peace in your body. But we're talking about a spiritual and an emotional peace. If you let the pain cause you to fear, doubt, be depressed, and all the negative emotional stuff, then it's doing something it shouldn't do. You have to find a way to accept that reality as being a reality and not allow it to cause you emotional losing of peace. Okay? There's a difference between the two. Most, mostly they go hand in hand. Most people lose both. When something disturbs your physical peace, it also disturbs your emotional peace and your spiritual peace. So really all three, all right? But you can control that. Okay, you can determine how you react emotionally to anything that happens around you. Could, would you say that Yeshua maintained his shalom when they were scourging him? I think he did. You think he maintained his shalom when they nailed him and put him up on the stake? Sure. 
Was he in pain? Sure. Did it disturb his physical peace? Absolutely. But he didn't lose his shalom emotionally and spiritually. He knew it was what it was. Next question is from Laurel Rutledge. Wait, well, I, have to, I, I do this a lot. Oh. I know I apologize. <laughs> to the person in all that pain, just understand that nothing I said meant that it was easy. Okay? So I don't want you to think that in any kind of a, you know, condescending or diminishing way, I'm not understanding that, that you are in constant pain. There are people that really deal with constant pain, and it's awful. So I'm not minimizing that. So I didn't say this was an easy thing to do. It wasn't easy to go through a lot of things that people go through that's very painful, even if they're not every day all the time. But you have to find a way to maintain your shalom, okay? And that's hard. That's hard. All right, go ahead. Okay, actually, I'm going to save that one for the very end. The next one is Nigel Phillips. Rabbi, is it correct to connect your last comment, one of the comments you were talking about uh, regarding emotional response, uh, affecting our peace to Matthew 6, 19, and 20. Yes, and we're going to get to that at some point in the teaching, that those verses are going to be in there. In 19 and 20, it says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust and destroy, and where thieves can break and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust, etc. Yes, okay? But really, the key to that is the emotional response. That was a person who was emotionally connected to things here, to stuff, okay? And we'll see that with the people that ask, you know, well, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And he says, well, then go and sell all your stuff. And he says, but I'm, I'm attached to my stuff. See, it's an emotional problem, all right? I understand that problem. I, I've said this before. I mean, I had a problem when I was a kid. If you stole, broke, or did any damage to one of my stuff, one, something I owned, that actually hurt me more emotionally because I was attached emotionally than if you went over and kicked me. That, that's, you know, people have that kind of a foolish attachment to the wrong things. Now, I don't have that problem, uh, you know, at, at this point. I, 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 I really... I had to work hard to get rid of it. And it still pops up in my head every now and then with my stuff, and I have to overcome that, you know? I had a shofar at one point, and I was traveling, and I, was, I had a few left of the ones I was traveling with, and I was selling them when I, would, I was visiting some congregations. And the lady said, our congregation needs a really great horn. I said, well, I've got a couple more left in the car. You can certainly buy one of those for the congregation. She said, no, I want that one. It was the one I was holding was mine. I said, well, that one's mine. She goes, I know, and that's, that's, that's the best one. I want that one. And so that's when the Ruach said to me, well, are you still challenged by this stuff thing? Or are you going to practice what you preach and give her the horn? So I gave her the horn, okay? And that's, you know, I could never have done that as a kid. That was mine, you know? My mother says the first word I learned as a kid was mine. That's a problem, you may have to be very aggressive to overcome those things by act going the other way and just giving everything away. There's a reason this ministry gives everything away. All right? It was part of my overcoming the emotional attachments to stuff. All right? Uh, okay, next question from... Wait, a... I'm sorry, do it again. <laughs> In case somebody wants to play that game with this horn, I'm going to tell you right now... I wouldn't sell you that horn only because it's not as good as my other ones. It's just mine. The one that I gave that lady was great. That was a great horn. It was in tune. It was perfect. This horn's actually, I don't even know why I keep it, all right? But I wouldn't sell it to you not because it's mine, but because it's not as good as the other ones you could buy off our website. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not in tune. I wouldn't, I almost didn't buy it when I bought it, but for some reason... That's what Abba wanted me to have, a flawed horn that I would just keep as mine. So, because some of you are thinking, oh, well, let's see if he's telling the truth. I'm going to try and buy his horn. If that's really what you wanted, but I don't know why you would want it. it. I know it makes the two or three really good notes. It goes beyond that. It's not good. Okay? And, I, and I've proven that at, at chauffeur clinics and everything else. It's just my horn. And one day I'll probably get rid of it and get to do something different. I've, I've often tried other horns and thought, this is going to be my new horn. And for whatever reason, he wants me to stick with this one. So I do. 
But I just want to preemptively strike there because somebody might be thinking, I want to see if he's right. I'm going to try and buy his horn. I'm telling you it's not that great. I'm not saying that to try to spin anything. I'm just telling you it goes out of tune on the fourth note. Okay? And I wouldn't sell one that doesn't stay in tune for five notes. That's what I say on the site. Okay? And so it goes flat on that fourth note. And so I wouldn't tell it. Anyway, just, just want to throw that out there because I know there's got to be somebody out there thinking, well, I want to see if he's, you know. Anyway, next, now you can ask the next question. Okay, next question is from Jennifer. She wants to know, can a person who has PTSD or bipolar disorder find that level of peace that Rabbi is talking about? I, I don't know... I mean, I do know enough about PTSD and, and bipolar and those, to a certain degree, I don't know enough about what those disorders allow or don't allow ultimately and how much they can get there. Just make the effort as best you can within the context of the disorder. I remember I was talking about in a lot of these things, it has to do with those who are not actually in a diagnosed handicap. In a diagnosed handicap, you have limitations because of your handicap. Remember, it's all about... Don't feel frustrated. Oh, I can't do this. I'm handicapped. No. It's all about Deuteronomy 8.2. It's about the effort. It's about your heart to make the effort. So try to make the effort in your coherent, cohesive, non-PTSD and non-bipolar moments to have peace. And by the way, have peace with the fact that you have PTSD and bipolar. Okay? That doesn't mean do, don't, don't stop doing things to try to address it. It just means have peace that for right now, this is what you have. All right? But have peace. You know, Paul says at one point, he says, look, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. It's your state that you're in, so be content. You have to walk it out from where you are in the condition you're in right now. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're physically handicapped, emotionally handicapped, psychologically, whatever it is, you have to walk it out from where you are. He called you knowing you had PTSD and knowing that you were bipolar. All right, so... That means that you can do this to whatever degree you can do this. And whatever degree you can do it, if you put in all your effort the best you can, it will be enough. It's a good question, though. Go ahead, next. And I'll try not to keep interrupting the question. <laughs> Norma Silva would like to know, 1430, is uh, 1430 applied to our times? No, applied to... I'm going to try to read her question here. She's putting me to the test. 1430 applied to our times means that he is distanced from us and we should depend on his ruach for protection against the ruler of this world? There will be a lot more that we talk about the, the world and the rule of this world as we go through the teaching, so just be patient with that. But the answer is we are still dealing with that verse. What he said, I shall no longer talk much with you for the rule of the world is coming. In the bigger context of it, we're still in that verse. The rule of the world has come, and we're under that uh, authority still, and uh, he doesn't talk to us much. Okay? And what little he does talk to us, we don't listen, so that's part of the problem. <laughs> All right. Next question is uh, from Bernard. Uh, Rabbi, to what extent do we make plans and preparations, or do we just live as we currently do now with shalom? Oh, no, no. You definitely do everything within your power, but you have contentment that while the process is playing out and you're doing all that you can, you don't do it out of fear, you don't do it out of panic, you don't do it out of anxiety, but you're doing it in contentment. You do it knowing that you're doing everything you can. So if there's something you can do in, in, in a place where you have struggle, like Bernard's in South Africa. It's a, it's a very challenging place. Okay, so, you know, you make plans for escape if there's going to be, like, civil war or whatever kind of thing that might happen. You make plans for provisions like we talked about uh, during the announcements. We didn't have it during the teaching year. But you should have plans for, I would say, 30 to 60 days worth of food. Just rotate it all the time since you're not letting it go bad. You should have plans that have financial ability to handle three to six months worth of the whole world shutting down so that you can afford to buy some things. Or, or when the world sh turns back on, you're not sitting there like broke, destitute, and, and with nothing. I mean, you should be preparing 
for all possible contingencies, but doing it not out of panic and fear and, and, and also not out of thinking that your preparation is going to fix everything. Just you have to do what you have to do. Whatever he's shown you, the wisdom that you have, the understanding that you have, do what you can do. So now we're going through an event, the coronavirus event. Bernard's going through two events, the coronavirus event and the upheavals that are going on in this country. We are to learn while we're in the event and then make the necessary adjustments during and for after the event. And so do everything you can do, but do it with shalom. Shalom doesn't mean, well, I've got peace. I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. No. But have peace while doing it. Okay. Okay, uh, Messiah Complex has a question. Is it safe to say that a lack of shalom is evidence that one has taken their eyes off Yeshua straight off the path maybe? Yes, I would say that there's probably some of that. You know, we're going to look at, um, we'll look at Peter, at Kepha walking out on the water. That's one of the verses we'll get to eventually. And he was fine until he took his eyes off Yeshua. <laughs> okay. And so, yes, I think when you take your eyes off of, the, it's not just taking your eyes off Yeshua, taking your eyes off of the whole picture and plan. This is why feast keeping is so important, because the feasts remind us in a cycle of the plan. And we go through the cycle of remembering this eventually leads to Shemini Atzeret at the end, which is, in essence, the new beginning of the new kingdom. Okay? And so we go through the Passover. We go through the wilderness journey from unleavened bread through Shavuot. We go through the, the uh, return and the, re, you know, the uh, coming of Messiah with trumpets and that kind of thing. We go through the atonement and the, the reconciliation that happens in the period between that and then when we finally get to Sukkot. Then we have like the thousand year reign where we figure this all out in a much more deep way, eventually leading to the kingdom. That process reminds us of the actual things that's happening in the, real, in the real world so that we can say, oh, wait a minute. Why am I worried about this? It's going to be a part of this process. Okay. Uh, Michelle Perez, I just want to read her comment. She says, uh, I, would, I was diagnosed 20 years ago with bipolar, with severe anxiety, manic depression, hyperphobia, suicidal tendencies. I am none of the above anymore. Oh, man. All right. Fantastic. All right, any more? Because we're about 5 o'clock. I'd like to wrap That's about it up. all the questions that are related to today's study. Okay, anything else? Please just submit your questions. Manny will take care of them as best he can or get them to me. You can send those to uh, media. media at mtoi.org, and then we'll try to address those as best we can. Manny loves doing that, by the way, because when he doesn't know the answer, he gets discipled because he comes to get me. Then I give him the answer, and then he learns something, so he likes that a lot, so... You know, don't, don't worry about sending in the questions. Send them all in. Send them all in. Stump the Manny. Okay. <laughs> That's right, because you can stump Manny, then that means he gets to come to me, and then he gets discipled on the, prod, on the thing. So it's good. All right. I think that's going to wrap it up. I really pray and hope that this teaching for this, for this time, for what we're going through, is going to be really significant. And I'm, it's probably going to go as many parts as we're still in this thing, so it'll be useful through the journey. I mean, after all, I said we're going to read through all the way through 17, and that's just the preamble to the teaching, okay? That's not the teaching. <laughs> the teaching isn't just John 14 through 17. I actually have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about, anxiety and worry and all these other things that are not just in John 14 through 17. So um, this is just the intro to the teaching to understand when Yeshua said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, what was the context of that? What was he talking about? What was the issue going on? And so we're going to get through... Uh, hopefully John 15 and, me, and see what else happens next time. But at least you know what's coming and I'm, I'm going to be set with that. It also buys me time. I'll tell you what, it, I have not had to put together, you know, from scratch a full, you know, original teaching for a while that wasn't like a remake of an old, and the amount of hours that I try, I tried to put basically a 60 hours worth of teaching into about 20 something hours of time I had to actually pull up every verse when I first did it, I copied and pasted all the verses into a Word doc, and I had, I think, 80 pages of verses. 80 pages, okay? Which got whittled down now to 17 pages, all right? And so, and we actually only covered half of one page, so just so you know. 
Um, but we have 80 pages, of, and so I'm just letting you know that, that that's the amount of work. Because some of you think, that, you know, might, may wonder, what's it take to put a teaching together? The way I do the studies and put it together, and bear in mind, that's just pulling the verses up with the right word in it. Now I've got to read each verse, see if it's actually relevant. Is it talking about it in the right context? Then I've got to do like I did with, with verse 27 of John 14. Next thing you know, I had to realize it covered four chapters for the context. How much time do you think I spent going back? How much further back? I mean, that took a little bit of time for me to then go forward and figure out where we're going to go with this thing. That was just to deal with one verse. I have to do that with every verse that we use. Where do I start? Where do I finish? And I got to sit there and wait for the Ruach to guide. I read a verse. Do you want me to start there? Nope, keep going. You want me to start there? Nope, keep going. You want me to stop here? Nope, keep going. Till I get, yes, that's where you're going to start. That's where you're going to stop. And guess what? On a Friday night before I teach, I'll review what I was planning to read the next day, and he'll change it on me. He'll have me start a little earlier or start a little late. I mean, you know, that can change. But that's why I review these things even on, on Friday nights before. So anyway... So keep me in prayer that I'll have enough time to spend, you know, just, just putting these things together because it's an in incredibly large volume of things. I mean, just go ahead and you look up in your concordance all the verses that have the word peace or anything that's peace, peaceful, anything like that. Worry, worried, anxious, anxiety, um, sad or sadness, uh, courage, strength, encouragement, uh, fear, doubt, doubting. I mean, think of how many thousands of verses I just gave you. Okay, I don't even think I covered all the words I looked up for the teaching. So just that's what it takes to do this. So if anybody's wanting to do this and wants to know what it takes to do this, and you think, oh, he just gets up here and wings it, not exactly. Okay? Now, I didn't have any more notes than just read John 14 and all the way to 17, but I did pull you out just so you know why, one or two verses from each of those chapters to show you how those chapters are still relevant to the point. Instead of just saying, and to understand this, we're going to read four chapters. But why? Because there's stuff in each of those chapters that connects to that one verse to complete the thought. I'm trying to give you some tools to show you how you can do your own studies too. But you're going to have to, over, if you're like me, you're going to have to overcome the ADD though. The ADD to sit there and go through two, three thousand verses of the word references. Because some people, I've had people say, well, you know, I don't know why we're so impressed with that guy. He just does word studies. Okay, well, then you do the word study. See if you come up with the same stuff. Because that's, he's, the person wasn't wrong. I really am just doing a word study. But it's so much more. But it starts off. It's more of a concept study. And I'm looking for key words for the concept. I want to understand what disturbs your peace and how you can have it. So what words will help me find the verses that talk about that? Okay, so that will give you a little insight to how I put the mechanics of putting a teaching together. Starts off with an idea and then trying to figure out what words are connected to that idea so I can find the verses that discuss that concept or idea. And then one verse will lead me to another verse will lead me to, oh, I never thought of that. That's connected. And I have to look at all more those words up and those things up and see where they're connected to and... Then you got to read all the verses before and after to figure out where to start and stop and what the full context is. Think of it like this. I use, this is the analogy that my wife understands because I, I used to do this all the time. Imagine you're doing a 3,000 or 5,000 piece puzzle. Okay? Because that's how many verses I probably looked up. And they're all in the box. And so you don't really know what you have, but you know they're probably part of the picture. And now wait. Imagine that your 5,000 piece box puzzle only has... 2,000 pieces that are actually part of the puzzle. The other 3,000 are similar, but they really are not related. Okay? Like, for example, I look up the word peace, and there's 1,000 verses. I'm making that up. I don't remember how many. It was 400, whatever it was. A lot of the verses that were in the phrase peace offerings. So none of those had anything to do with this. But they still were in the box. I still had to go through them and find them. Okay? So now the first thing you got to do is flip over Three, four, five thousand pieces. And then you got to look at each piece to see if it's even part of the puzzle. Then you got to take the ones that you have that are part of the puzzle, and you got to realize I'm missing more pieces 
that are linked to those pieces. Like the piece is part of something, but there's pieces that go on this side of it and that side of it and that side of it that are connected, and now I gotta figure out where they are. And then you gotta figure out, are they themed? In other words, are they about what disturbs your peace? Are they about how you gain peace? Are they about worry as that separate category than being afraid? Is it separate from being doubting and, and dealing with doubt or fear? Look, we did a lot of teachings, uh, a lot of stuff about fear as in fear of Yahweh. Now we're going to be doing fear from being afraid. Because that's a different fear. I showed you the good fear, the fear, all reverence, and respect in fear of Yahweh. Now I'm going to show you a different fear where they're afraid of stuff they shouldn't be afraid of. Okay? And so, you know, when I talk to my wife and I'm putting a teaching there, she'll say, where are you in the teaching? I said, I'm still, pulling the, I'm still pulling the pieces out of the box and flipping them over. So she knows I'm still looking up all the verses. Or I'm saying, I've got all the pieces flipped over, now I'm trying to separate them by category. Like, I want all the blue pieces over here and all the red pieces over there, or maybe all the pieces that look like worry and all the pieces that look like afraid. And, you know, I'm trying to piece things together that I know attached together, that are connected and then I got to start to see how it all tells a story and makes the, makes the point that needs to be made. And that takes probably 40 to 60 hours to do it right, which is why this isn't even complete. This is enough I knew I could get started with. But the part that they're going to take the long part is the part where we didn't get into yet. This chapters 14 through 17 is going to buy me the time to put in the 60 hours sorting through the other 5,000 pieces. You see what I'm saying? You understand? So I, I, I revealed my secrets. <laughs> They're not really secrets, but you understand? Uh, maybe that was useful to somebody. I'm just hoping that was maybe useful to somebody to understand. That's what's going on. I look for the themes and connect them together, but I have to first go through the drudgery. And if you know me, you know I've got a horrible ADD problem, and you have no idea the torture it is when I look up and I see there's going to be 400 verses, or when I actually copied them all into my Word doc, so I didn't have to figure it out on the screen whether or not I wanted to keep the verse or not. I figured it's easier just to put it in a doc and just delete them as I don't need them. And to look at 82 pages, what it was, and say, I've got to look through every verse on 82 pages. Okay. Okay. And as I got through it, now I'm down to 17 pages of what I think. I've, I've already looked at all of the pages, including the 17. But that's what I've got left to sort through is the 17 pages. And I'm still going to end up getting rid of some of that. But still, you know, it's a little daunting. I did have a guy one year came up to me and he said, well, Rabbi, you know, I know you're doing Torah study. It was on a Torah study night and we were doing it live, you know, get, get together. He said, but I really would rather as you just teach, you know, could you tell me how to do it so I could do it myself? And when I explained this process, he looked at me and says, wow, that's, that's way too much work. <laughs> I said, okay, then sit down and listen. I don't know what else to tell you. It's a lot of work. Because a lot of people say, well, I don't know why we need a teacher. Why can't we just do this ourselves? Because... She, you won't. And the part that's my anointing, you don't have it anyway. After you sort all the pieces out, everything else, you might not know what to do with them. You might not see the connections. Look, I didn't see that connection between John 14 and, and, and Revelation 21 in that clarity, those verses, until today as I said it to you. So would you have found that same connection? Maybe. I don't know. I'm just saying. You know, sometimes it has to be in the moment. All right, look, you know what I think also you need to know is that when we finally start doing the discipleship program and the training program with the yeshiva, I will do one of these type of studies live with the class where we'll look up the verses and you'll see, you'll actually watch me go. Brianna actually did that last night. She sat with me and watched me go through verses and actually I pull up a verse and I asked her, okay, where do you think we should start? Where do you think we should end? She did very well. She got a few of them right. She did good, but she wanted to see how I do these things. So she sat with me. And I said, okay, here's the next verse that we're looking at. Let's now go, look before it and after it, see where we're going to start, where we're going to end. And she did really good. And, um, but I think that, I think some of you, I know Manny would like it to sit there and watch and we'll do it together. Maybe we could do it virtually on a screen and I could pull up and show you this is the verses and we'll start from just grabbing all the verses, then going through them, seeing how I decide what's a relevant verse, why it's not relevant to what the point is. And then, I mean, it'll be hours and hours of stuff that we could do together and watch a teaching get put together. And I think that might be 
very good for some people. So we'll do that with uh, a yeshiva class or a discipleship class, I think. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, let Manny know on the uh, media at MTOI, and then we'll keep you, you know, a way to get, you know, give us your email or how we can get in touch with you. If I ever get to do this, you know, I'll let you know. We'll see, work it out. But I think it was, I, I really enjoyed the way Brianna was getting a lot out of it, and I could see how it could be good for everybody. Well, not everybody, but the ones who want to, you know, to see how that could work. Because she often sits with me, and actually, she also knows the other side of it. I have her working on a teaching that I'm doing called The Agriculture of Yah, and she looked up the verses, and there's a few times she's like, wow, there's 500 of those. I'm like, yep, write them all down. And so, you know, she, she really did a lot of the work on, you know, she looked up things like, you know, grass and dirt and land or whatever. I don't know, what words did you look up already? None of those. Which ones did you do? Tree, seed, fruit. Okay, so what was the one? Garden. So she looked up all the verses. So she wanted to be like my teaching assistant. So she started to look up these verses. And then she realized, there's a lot of work. And it's kind of, it's kind of drudgery in a way because you're just pulling up a lot of verses at first. But it becomes incredible as you watch it develop after that. I love this part of it where I look at the verse and figure out what the connections. The pulling all the verses out, though, I'd rather have a teaching assistant do that for me. <laughs> you know, that, that just, and then go, but the hard part is I, a teaching assistant couldn't necessarily sort through all the verses to decide whether or not they're applicable to what I'm looking for. But, you know, some of it would be obvious, but well, that's why I want to do it with a group. Anyway, that was a long-winded way after a closing prayer to keep talking. Come on up here. Shabbat shalom.